Today we will be looking at the subject of private equity and in particular where we think uh, private equity might be going. So what's hot at the moment in private equity, what's not, what might be coming next over the next three to five years. So today uh, in conversation we have Professor Tim Jenkinson uh, with Chris Kalos who is a corporate partner at Kirkland and Ellis, a corporate law firm working largely with uh, corporates and private equity funds and their, their portfolio uh, companies. Uh, uh, Tim Jenkinson is a professor of finance here at the uh, Said Business School, University of Oxford. Uh, he has uh, led the uh, Oxford Private Equity Programme for 10 years now, coming into uh, a 10-year anniversary. That is one of one of our most uh, successful executive programmes, and we'll be uh, talking a little bit more about that at the end of the uh, conversation today. Tim is also the director of the Private Equity Institute at the Business School. So that is the, the research center which concentrates very much on private equity, latest trends, what's happening, looking at portfolio returns, uh, looking at deals, looking at selection, uh, also focusing very much on IPOs and asset management. Uh, and also Tim is now a founding member of the Private Equity Research Consortium, uh, along with some other leading schools uh, from, from the US. We're lucky to have Chris Kalos with us today. So Chris is a partner at Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, Chris will also be joining us for the Oxford Private Equity Programme in June, where he will give a session on waterfalls and distribution. Uh, Chris is very well qualified to, to talk about that and related uh, subjects. He's internationally recognized as one of the, the, the top attorneys in terms of fund formation uh, and management. Uh, he also oversees M&A, uh, tax, estate planning uh, for a range of leading private equity funds and their portfolio companies and former portfolio companies. Chris is also a associate fellow at the Said Business School, University of Oxford, uh, where he helps Tim and others in the research center uh, in terms of research and also does some, some teaching with us on the exec program as 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 mentioned uh, and also on some of our other programs as well so the format today is going to be uh, a conversation between tim and chris for the next 30 40 minutes or so uh, it will cover uh, a range of hot topics in the range of uh, in, the, in the range of pe as we go through as we go through, uh, we hope that you'll ask questions as we go through. So the, the intention would be that we address your questions as, as we go through the next 30, 40 minutes, as opposed to having a Q&A session at the end. So with that, uh, in front of you on the screen, there is a question panel. So the way to uh, to ask questions is to answer is to, to type those into your keyboard uh, because we have uh, a large number of people online at the moment we mute all all, uh, all microphones so please uh, type your questions in there and we will endeavor to answer them as we go through so with that i will pass over to tim jenkinson to introduce himself and chris a little bit more and to leave the conversation from there over to you tim Okay, thanks very much, Steve, um, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, or good morning, if, it's, uh, if that's where you are. Uh, it's great to be back here in, uh, we're actually in, sitting in London, in Kirkland and Ellis's uh, lovely headquarters in the Gherkin in London. Uh, and Chris, great to have you here again. To, to, this time what we're going to do is look ahead um, and uh, think a bit about what the emerging trends are in private equity. Um, we called this 2020 uh, in terms of private equity. It used to be 2020 was a long way off. It's now, I realize, not very long off at all. Um, so it's not looking a huge amount ahead, but we are looking, maybe going to start off by looking at what the emerging trends are in the market. And um, maybe the first question is to just get a sense as to how hot things are at the moment. 2017 looked like a pretty pretty hot year for private equity, Chris. Is, is that your interpretation? Uh, absolutely. It was a, a landmark year for fundraising across the whole private funds market. Uh, some people have referred to it as kind of as good as it gets. Um, I'm sure at some point we'll say it was not as good as it gets and it got uh, better, but uh, it was a very good year. European fundraising uh, here was uh, particularly active. A record amount of European capital was raised in 2017. And we're still seeing investors increase their allocations to private equity. Uh, and some new investors coming in from Europe and elsewhere. Uh, a survey recently said that 92% of LPs 
uh, indicate that they will devote the same or more capital to private equity over the coming year. And, you know, 96% saying they uh, intend to maintain or increase allocation. So it is still attracting new investors and more capital from existing investors. The total um, capital raised for 2017 was $754 billion. So it was a, a very big year. Yeah. I mean, that's getting close to, if, if not exceeding the sort of pre-financial crisis numbers, I guess. So it feels a bit like 2008, again, from that perspective. But the difference here is, is that there's, you know, in sitting in 2018, there looks like there's quite a lot of political and other sort of threats facing the world. And yet private equity looks like it's one of those asset classes where investors feel more sort of more comfortable actually committing capital. Um, do you think there are any clouds on the horizon for the for the private equity sector specifically with the current geopolitical situation? Well, there's certainly some things that uh, people are monitoring. So um, one is that there's a lot of dry powder right now uh, with all that capital having been raised. There's over a trillion dollars of uh, capital, uncalled capital available in these funds. And uh, when you combine that with what look like relatively high valuations, lenders are still uh, providing lots of uh, debt, high debt multiples, um, relatively light covenants. Um, you know, the uh, debt to EBITDA ratio for large U.S. LBOs are approaching six times, which was last seen just pre-financial crisis. So um, it's a, a bit of a heady market. Um, so uh, I think investors both uh, in private equity and the private equity investors at the private equity firms who are investing in companies are, um, you know, being pretty particular uh, about the kinds of companies they're investing in. The sponsors are stressing what really makes them different, talking about how they performed during the financial crisis, talking about um, uh, the resilience that they have and, and the ability to add value to the portfolio companies that's so not just leveraging. Um, so that's, you know, that's all going on. I think there's an expectation or at least um, an acceptance that the overall returns may shrink somewhat uh, for money getting out in this market. Uh, but it's still on a relative basis attractive to people and uh, so we're, that's why we're still seeing lots of capital coming in. Yeah. It's funny because I think the analogy with 2008 is quite strong actually, although, you know, I suppose that um, maybe investors are thinking that next time round, you know, maybe the banking sector won't fall away so so rapidly and, and, and the like, so maybe the investing will continue. But, but do you think there is a sense in which people are raising big funds now, not, in expect, not expecting to deploy them quite as fast because it because valuations are so high and the like and um, and you know maybe have that capital ready uh, in case valuations fall sort of buying into a dip in the market do you think there's any of that is there anything in the fund the way they're setting up the funds which would corroborate that hypothesis I guess uh, that's uh, I think an astute observation I, I think the sponsors are trying to get their capital raised before there's an obvious bend in the road um, you've got to get your capital raise when it's a good time to raise capital, and now is a good time to raise capital. Uh, you also have to deploy the capital when you can find great opportunities. And so I think um, the sponsors these days are planning to be pretty opportunistic with the capital that they raise. But these are limited life funds, and you wouldn't want to um, have a, a hiccup in the market in the next six months, not be able to raise capital to take advantage of what might be some very attractive opportunities as uh, as some disruption happens whatever you know don't know when or what will happen but i'm sure mm -hmm. there'll be something at some point that happens to create opportunities for for these players uh, because the sector has attracted so much talent over the last decade or two i think investors do feel a certain level of confidence uh trusting you know these experienced uh folks in managing their money uh it was proven out i think during both the, the financial crisis and prior downturns that while it may take a little longer and the returns may not be, you know, uh, as exciting as they might otherwise have hoped. Um, private equity has kind of weathered these storms, you know, pretty well. Yeah. And then and one of the one of the worries, I suppose, or, or what one of the problems that we saw last time, if you like, those of us old enough to remember the 2008 effect on private equity wasn't so much that the private equity funds themselves ultimately did too badly, but the banks the banks just disappeared. They were sort of comatose for a while, uh, ne none more so than in London, where some of the biggest players actually quit the market. And just moving, sort of um, looking again at sort of more general terms, do you think that that might be different now with the fact that we've got a lot more private credit funds coming in and that you know one of the biggest trends that I think we've seen in the last, well, it's probably only the last two or three years has been the fact that 
it's no longer necessarily the banks that are doing the lending to the to the to the buyout funds it's the it's either it's it's buyout fund invest buyout gps who are now getting into credit funds and specialist credit lenders do you think that will do you think that will make it more sustainable and, and, and less cyclical if if there is a a downturn in 2020 uh, in a word yes i think um these funds aren't playing with on-demand deposits uh, so you know they have committed well, most of these are, are, are funds where the, the amounts are committed long term for the for this asset class, and so you know there's there's I think a little more stability uh, and a little less need for liquidity uh, in those in those funds. Um, so I think that that will help. Uh, you're right to point out the rise of credit. It has uh, been kind of the story for the last couple of years, and I think it will be increasingly the story in private equity going forward for at least the next few years. Uh, there's a lot of capital being raised. Uh, for credit funds, um, and, yeah, if you think about it, credit is a much bigger part of uh, the private equity market than equity, right? You're getting a multiple on the equity for the credit, so there's lots of opportunity to put money to work. I think sponsors are seeing it as a logical extension of their existing uh, product line. So, you know, often the second product line or the third product line that a monoline manager may evolve into is credit. Yeah. And so um, they're doing that, and I think what they're finding is it's a different product. It's not necessarily one commingled fund. There might be a lot of separately managed accounts. Uh, it has, you know, a bigger component of the overall returns is, is, is the fees because the, you know, the, the, the um, returns on the investment aren't quite as high typically as you might expect in private equity. But it's a very scalable business because of the size of the credit market. Uh, you might either form much, you know, you may go from a successful credit fund to a much larger uh, successor fund where the ability to do that in private equity has, you know, has is not as the same as it was in, in the heyday. So yeah. you do see people increasing their private equity fund sizes, but the ability to scale credit is becoming more and more appreciated by the sponsors, and that's I think part of the attraction of the space. Yeah, and it might be worth just pointing out to people: this is a very new area, the private credit funds, and maybe just by way of explanation, it's quite a big change because in the past, in the old days, this used to be the banks that were doing most of the lending to the private equity funds, and now. It's as much these new players who basically, they don't take your or my deposits and lend them to private equity funds. It's uh, pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, lending to or investing in these funds, which then lend directly to corporates. And so it's a very, it's a very different sort of way of doing things, but it is a natural step. Just one other question on the, on the credit front. Is there, a, is there any concern about potential conflicts of interest if the same organization was lending money to the organization which was also putting the equity in? In a sense, if you, know, if you have the private credit arm providing the debt and the private equity arm providing the equity, is that a, 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 in your role as a lawyer, is that something which you know, we should all be... Does that set any sort of bells ringing? Sure, that's uh, a common issue that comes up and is discussed and negotiated as part of putting these um, in place. Some of these credit funds primarily invest in other uh, sponsors' product. And so you can imagine um, if the equity fund is bidding on a deal, uh, gets outbid by an, another private equity firm, they may come back in on the credit side and provide the credit to that deal. They've right. diligence that deal um, and it's a way to participate in that deal at a you know somewhat lower return, but also lower risk perspective, sitting on top of um, the person who outbid you for the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, some of them are dedicated to kind of non deals that done by different sponsor. Um, some of them do focus on or either exclusively or to a significant degree on the sponsor's own deals. Mm -hmm. And in those, um, yes, there's. A, a lot of attention paid to those conflicts, yeah. um, either uh, setting forth a, a set of rules that are kind of pre-approved by the investors in the fund documents or other processes to make sure that both going into the investment and also if it hits a bump in the road, uh, conflicts are dealt with appropriately. You can, you can imagine that if a portfolio company in which the equity fund and the debt fund are both invested um, suddenly starts violating debt covenants you've got very different hats on. Yeah. And so often those situations are dealt with by having a rule that says, for example, the credit fund cannot have a majority of the debt 
of the portfolio company has to be with other parties and they would right. follow on or they may not have the same voting rights. So uh, somebody else who doesn't have that conflict, at least in that example, would be managing that process of working through that difficulty. Yeah. And do you see, especially from the U.S. context, do you see where I think this, you know, the U.S. funds really led this, but do you see this area expanding? Is private credit going to keep growing, do you think? Uh, I, I do think so. But based on the number of sponsors uh, that I'm working with that are launching their first credit fund or launching additional credit funds, scaling up the size of their credit funds, uh, this is an area. Now, I don't know what happens if there's a dramatic increase in interest rates because some of these strategies work very well in a low interest rate environment and may not work so well in a high interest rate environment. Right. But for now, um, there is a lot of money being raised by the existing sponsors. Uh, who have been in credit for a long time and by people who are you know, stepping into it in various ways now. Right. Okay, great. And I should just stress, if people want to ask questions, by all means do. We, uh, I, have, I have plenty, but uh, we're, we're very happy to answer any questions that, that, that you may have. Um, going back to 2017, another big trend seemed to be, the again, which is on the, it feels like 2008 theme, is the, is the mega funds. Uh, you know, we're seeing now, I guess, some of the largest funds ever raised, but the previous high point had been 2008, broadly, I think. Um, and uh, is this um, is is this going to continue? Do you think? It, how, how big how big was it? Because it looked like there were, you know, more than something like 18 mega funds raised in 2017. Um, and, and what's the dynamics there in terms of, is, is, is this the way people are going in terms of the mega funds come back to investors? I, I, I heard that investors didn't want mega funds anymore. They wanted private equity, they wanted mid market, but mega funds were sort of the ones they thought would be more tricky because they tended to buy public targets or over, you know, deploy, as it were, capital in too many big lumps. So what's your, what, what's your sense of how that's working out? The, the, era, the era of the mega fund is kind of continuing. Um, you were right, there were a number raised in 2017, including some you know, very large ones. So SoftBank raised $91 billion, uh, Apollo, which is the largest private equity fund you know, ever raised. Apollo raised uh, almost $25 billion for their buyout fund, their flagship buyout fund, which is the largest buyout fund ever raised. CDC raised 16 billion euro uh, to have the largest euro denominated fund ever raised and KKR Asian fund raised the largest Asian fund ever raised at 9.3 billion. So there's some real eye popping um, mega fund funds being raised in 2017. Um, in terms of looking forward, uh, well, first to address one of your comments, you know, gee, I thought people had soured on that. Yeah. I, I think they've been finding that these funds, um, you know, can d deliver pretty good risk adjusted returns. So, um, you know, they've, they've performed well, people see that performance and um, they seem uh, willing to continue uh, to back it. Uh, there is still a lot of interest in the middle market, and we can talk more about that later, but I think um, you're right, there was a conventional wisdom for a while that mega funds would be really challenged. Everybody a few years ago was uh, describing themselves as, you know, maybe an upper upper middle market uh, buyout fund and, and people didn't like the term, but that seems to have changed. And, and so if you look at um, kind of the coming year, because so many of the very large sponsors, there's only so many sponsors that can raise seven, eight billion dollars, um, because so many of them did go to market recently, um, I would expect somewhat fewer eye-popping sizes of mega funds, at least mm -hmm. in quantity, um, in the coming year. But we will see a number of kind of uh, managers that you might not think of as having mega funds because their most recent fund size was three or four billion dollars. Some of those are, uh, uh, we get a little bit of a preview of these things, um, some of those are will be coming to market in 2018 with kind of something that's more like five, five and a half billion dollars. So mm -hmm. there may be some new interest into kind of the smaller end of the mega fund and there'll be plenty of mega funds raised in 2018, but I don't think it's going to be um, quite as uh, visible a trend in 2018 as it was in 2017. Right. Oh, we've got a question asking actually pretty much the same time that you mentioned SoftBank, it came in from, from, from Daniel saying, you know, what do you think about SoftBank's uh, fund, which after all is the, is, the, is the king of the mega funds, right? 100 billion, 100 billion roughly dollars. Um, and uh, obviously in the VC, well, I don't know whether to call it a VC fund. It's sort of, a, it's bigger than, it's probably, what, 20 times bigger than any other VC fund ever raised, if it is a VC fund. But um, 
do you see well, well how, how do you interpret that do you think that's that is a sort of uh, um, do you think it's going to be a long-term holding vehicle or do you think it's just a big portfolio of late stage venture capital type deals pre-ipo deals um, people look at it in different ways I don't know whether you have a, your own uh, view of this. I'll, I'll try not to do this very much in this conversation, <laughs> but um, speaking about specific clients, uh, yeah. funds and strategies is something we're probably going to have Okay, <laughs> sure. Well, I'll tell you what, yes, I, I, I won't give you my views on it, but I think it is fairly, it is reasonably, it is reasonably transformational in that sense that, you know, I think everybody in Silicon Valley is thinking, you know, what the hell is going on here? And uh, I suppose it's, it is though a p potential way that a lot of VC firms can exit to SoftBank. Uh, whether they're whether they're going to be early stage investors is less clear. I think. Um, just going back down from the mega funds down to the mid market, but is the mid market still as buoyant as it ever was? I think I think it's doing very well. Um, I think there are a number of folks that are having trouble getting into the middle market fund of their choice because they haven't scaled up the sizes dramatically. Um, but the ones with good performance, the kind of hot middle market funds. Um, are very hard uh, to, to get into as a new investor and hard for existing investors to get the allocations that they may want. So part of the reason that you're seeing, I think, the, the mega fund trend is it's very hard to put $100 million or $200 million to work or more uh, in a, a, an individual middle market fund because they're just, you know, that would be a very large investment. There are some investments that size in middle market funds on the larger middle market funds, but um, it's, you know, you, you see uh, clients, you know, capping people out at something less than that yeah. um, because they have so much demand. So it is still a very hot area. I think people continue to think that um, the right strategies in, in that, that market will do very well. Mm -hmm. um, they are kind of working to differentiate themselves from each other. Um, and, uh, you know, they all have their own story. And, and a lot of those have been very successful. We have a lot of middle market funds in the, in the market. And uh, very many of them are oversubscribed. Lots of them are hitting and exceeding their targets. Right. And, and in that situation, are you seeing much pu push on terms of the economics of, uh, you know, the f management fees or carry or, or hurdle rates or things like that for the very successful plan, you know, the sponsors who, who've got all this excess demand or are they cutting back on co-investment opportunities or how are they responding to that excess demand? We, we should talk about co-investment opportunities separately because mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting area. Yeah. Um, on the basic economics, we're not seeing, uh, we're not seeing the, carry really changing. Um, you know, you still see some folks pushing for uh, stepped up carries if they hit a certain threshold. So How does that work? Carries. So uh, often if they have a lot of demand, I mean, if you're a sponsor and you have a lot of demand and you don't want to raise your fund size mm -hmm. um, and you know that investors don't want you uh, getting a fee that's not tied to performance, um, you know, pressing on that issue. So yeah. if you have kind of a full fee already, the place where you can, you know, increase the rewards for yourself or is to have premium carry. And investors tend to be, for the right managers, accepting of that if you truly do outperform. So you'll have additional threshold. If you return 2x, maybe you get, or 2.5x, you may get um, a step up in the carry rate. See. If you uh, return 3x, you might get another step. So for really, um, you know, uh, great performance, the, um, the investors are willing to entertain that. Um, it's not... A major trend. It's not like lots of folks are doing that, but mm. a number of people have done in the past, and some people are still uh, either keeping what they had or, or newly asking for uh, what is often called premium carry. I see. And so that works by if you've got so 20%, you get your 20% carry up to say two times the money or two and a half times the money, and then you get like 25% on the on the increment between two and a half and three or something. Is that the way it works? Yeah, often there's a catch up. So you end up getting oh. that full carry on the full amount if you can oh, get right. the thresholds. Okay. We did get a question. Um, what about the other side of the coin uh, dealing with uh, small cap P? I yeah. think um, it, it's interesting. I was uh, sitting in a very small city in the Midwest at an investor meeting and was talking with a very large investor in Europe. So, you know, those two things you wouldn't necessarily think happen that frequently, large mm. European investor yeah. visiting a small U.S. city, um, but they were um, they were most excited about small cap private mm. equity. They they think at least that um, the best opportunities that they can chase are in that space. Right, and so they're making the effort to really get to know managers on the very small end. Now, 
the challenge is, you know, in that particular fund, they will be the largest investor and they might have trouble doing $50 million. So it doesn't, mm. you know, you, you can't get a lot of money, you know, in this world, a lot of money out um, uh, easily that way. It's a lot of work, but for people that are doing the work, um, you know, they're, there's a perception that there's some great opportunities there. Uh, those are usually involved, I think, some more diligence because you're not going to have typically the long-term track record. These might be small funds started by someone who left another manager, so you need to try and figure out deal attribution and things like that yeah. to get comfortable that it's a great opportunity. But you know, it's an entrepreneurial industry. One of the great things about being a lawyer in this industry is that mm -hmm. it's producing new clients every year. Yeah, sure. And so uh, there are we have a lot of. Um, smaller funds, so you know, let's say sub 400 million, kind of mm. two, 300 million dollar funds, some a little smaller, um, that investors are very excited about. Yeah, and do you, and, and are you seeing on the on still on the small cap theme? I mean, are you seeing uh, more first time man first time managers, and not first time investors, I guess, but you know, people spawning out of larger larger private equity shops and forming their own funds? Is this, is this a, a... I would I would say it's continuing at pace. It's always right. been happening and, and it continues to happen um, for a variety of reasons. So it's it's hard to judge. I mean, the market's gotten so big. We, we have, uh, we'll, we'll do four or 500 funds this year. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, and then we're one law firm. Um, and so there's a lot. So it's hard to kind of spot a trend amid all of that mm -hmm. um, in terms of whether there are more first time funds, but there are a lot of first time funds. But as you said, they're typically not first-time investors. I mean, the the the, the most um, first time we really see is is somebody who, uh, you know, one guy from one shop, a person from another shop, maybe a woman from third shop, come together yeah. and start uh, raising capital, and it's their first time together. Yeah. But more commonly, these are folks that are leaving, like you know, a pair of folks leave um, leave a, a existing manager and strike out on their own. Yeah. Yeah, let's go back to co-investment for a minute because that's obviously been whenever all the conferences I go to, you know, you, you not only hear that they want to increase their private equity allocation, but they want to increase the amount they do in co-investment as well, where they they invest in some additional deals on a, a sort of deal by deal basis and deploy capital, very often with zero fees or carry on that, not always, but but very often, um, and uh, people are sort of you know are, are almost sometimes making it. It's one of the decisions, seems to be one of the decisions about whether they go into a GP at all as to whether they're going to get co-invest. Um, is, this, is, this is, is this still the case, do you think? Are people, are more and more investors wanting to do co-investment? And, 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 and what does that say to you about the, the sort of the gap between being an LP and a GP? Because, you know, in some ways the LPs are doing the job of the GPs in, in having to do deal due diligence and the like. I think there's a really interesting space to watch. Um, I was at a conference uh, just a couple of days ago, and they actually polled the audience, uh, which was comprised primarily of um, sponsor side fund attorneys, and asked um, in a single deal, uh, let's say, you know, investing alongside a mid size small cap fund, a $750 million buyout fund, so a smaller mm -hmm. to mid size buyout fund, um, what would you expect in terms of charges on the co invest as a carried interest? And 43% of the folks said zero, which, you know, 10 years ago would have been like 95%. Uh, of only 43%? Uh, yes. 38% um, said 10% and 17% and said 15%. So um, not only is the co are people sort of uh, investors very interested in co-invests um, to the point of um, silliness at some point. I mean, yeah. I've had investors clamoring to have co-investment rights in a distressed turnaround fund and, <laughs> and the manager turned to the investor said so you're going to go to committee and tell them that we're yeah. losing money we're losing market share we're not profitable yeah. and we're trying to avoid kind of a, a full-blown restructuring and you want to cut you're going to back a co-investment yeah i want to put and more so, money well, yeah, to work there and so <laughs> Um, so that would may not be uh, the best area to, to see co-investors, but uh, investors are very excited about co-investments uh, for a variety of reasons. Some see it as a way to just lower their economic costs in the deal. So even if it's a 10% carry, that's still cheaper than a 20% carry. Um, and the fees are often a bit lower as well. So you might see you know 1% fee or just um, a kind of budgeted fee to cover expenses. Mm. Uh, so it can be a way of lowering your overall economics. I think people were worried about adverse selection on that. So they thought, hey, if I'm just going to lower my, uh, my economics, um, are the best opportunities going to be gobbled up by the manager and maybe other private equity firms that are doing a club deal? Well, the club deals have basically gone down in, in terms mm. of 
um, frequency. You don't see a lot of club deals anymore. And I think that's in part because it's going to be replaced with LP co-investment. Mm. And uh, one of my favorite Oxford professors wrote an interesting article that uh, overturned, I think, conventional wisdom on adverse selection bias. And perhaps you're familiar with it. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That took a, that, That's still uh, still ongoing. But yes, anybody who wants to read that particular one can just uh, Google Tim Jenkinson co-investments. You'll find it. So thanks for the plug, Chris. But yeah, that was, yeah, that the, the evidence seems to be that the that the that the deals that are offered for co-investment are a fairly uh, unselected sample of the uh, underlying fund investment. So you're not getting a bad draw. You're not get, just getting the dog deals. You're getting a, the full distribution, which and, I think is. And as you said, some that. some investors have very developed co-investment programs, and they're doing their own diligence on these deals. Mm -hmm. um, some of uh, some of the co-investment is coming from dedicated co-investment funds. So I have three funds right now that are either pure co-investment funds. Um, now, the, the fund is a pure co-investment fund, but as you might imagine, in order to get those opportunities, the, the sponsor also has a direct fund investing product right. that's helping to keep those relationships going. Um, and then two others where there's a heavy mix of co-investment in the allocation for the fund. Mm -hmm. And so th there is uh, more and more capital being raised in that space um, and, uh, and it's kind of chasing just co-investments. Yeah. And in terms of um, one thing we spoke about last year was the um, the the problems that were caused from measuring returns when you had the funds actually not necessarily calling the capital straight away because they had these so-called subscription lines where you could sort of but borrow money from a bank for doing the investment initially um, and only call the the investor's capital at a later stage, which of course has a effect of pumping up IRRs in funds because the money is not being deployed for so long. Um, is that continuing? Is it getting worse? Are there any other new innovations? Uh, you know, and how are, and how are you seeing invest funds funds dealing with that issue? So I'll, I'll take a little bit of issue with the word worse because that implies <laughs> that this is a negative uh, development. Um, sponsors are using these a lot. And they're yeah. using them um, more than they used to. Uh, they're keeping the money um, uh, deployed through co through um, subscription lines for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. and um, and more and more managers are doing it. And in fact, um, if you talk to the lending side, uh, the lenders are encouraging the managers to do it because if they don't, uh, their comparative returns, their IRRs relative to their competitors, may be um, uh, adversely affected. And so, if everyone else is Goosing their IRRs, so to speak, yeah. with uh, with this this um, subscription line, and you don't, you might suddenly be second quartile when you otherwise would have been first quartile, which can have a dramatic impact on your fundraising. So, um, in part for that, in part for convenience for the LPs, um, uh, and for the GP not having to call money potentially way in advance of when it's um, needed in case of deals that get delayed, et cetera. You're seeing a lot of this. Um, ILPA, the the um, LP advocacy uh, group um, raised a, a yellow flag, I would say, about this mm -hmm. about a year ago uh, with some concern about how it does goose IRRs, how it can help managers get to uh, satisfying the preferred return hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, based on that, I think some LPs have been asking more questions about it. But uh, I wouldn't say we've gotten a lot of pushback on having the plans, uh, so having a subscription line in place. We are seeing uh, more attention than maybe there used to be on ring fencing the um, duration of those drawdowns and the aggregate amount. So the aggregate amount has always been limited um, in most funds to something like 20% of commitments. Right. Um, and, you know, there used to be this idea that you would call it down for 10, 20, 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, when we delete that requirement, that's when uh, investors say, hey, we want some limitation. Like, what is your intention? Yeah. And uh, then and did they gets, last years now or, or months? It's, it's, or how, it's how not long? uncommon for it to be, uh, you know, six months, th th to be permitted mm -hmm. to be outstanding for six months to two years, sometimes longer. In terms of use, uh, they are outstanding longer. Maybe not mm -hmm. to, I haven't, you know, it's too early to see whether they're going to be out for two years because this is a newer development. Yeah. But I have s seen uh, sponsors, particularly during fundraising, say, hey, don't worry about truing up for final closings. Don't worry about capital calls that you might feel are disproportionately burdensome on you as an early closing LP mm. that you're kind of you're bridging later closing LPs. We're going to bridge all of that right. by doing everything through a subscription line until the final closing. Yeah. And so that might be six months or a year of um, 
funding all of their deals um, right. based on, on a subscription line. So we do see that happening as well. It helps with the J curve. I mean, it, there there are a lot of benefits to it, but it does you know it does have some of the effects that LPs were concerned about. So they are paying more attention. To yeah, that. I mean, I think that from a, from my, my perspective, I've argued for a while that IRRs are not a very good way of measuring returns. It strikes me this is the death knell of IRR. You know, in in a way. You know, the the if it, you you don't just need to know the IRR, you need to know the fund terms in order to interpret it, and there'll be this this major. There was never a very high correlation between IRRs and money multiples in the in the old days, and now that correlation is going to go down even more. And my suspicion is, as well, you know, people like me have been saying for a while, you've got to think, you know, money is much more important than IRR. Uh, pe people have said for a long time <laughs> you, you can't eat IRR, which That's is right. true. And so yeah. people, um, as evidenced by what we were talking about before in the premium carry scenario, when people are really looking at did this manager outperform by an, a, a meaningful degree where I want to where I get comfortable at least giving the manager an additional reward, mm -hmm. those are usually on money multiples, not IRRs. So the two and a half times, yeah. three times is a money multiple measurement of outperformance. Yeah. But it does, I think, by by definition almost, having a subscription line means that the carry hurdle is less, right? I, I would rather have an 8%, if I've got an 8% hurdle, I'd rather have a subscription line which will help me get over that hurdle. So. I can see it from the LP yep. perspective as well, and it, and you know the LPs will also say if I wanted to borrow money to to um, improve my returns, I can do that at at my level. I don't have to have you do that for me. Yeah, I, I think it's also something that's to a significant degree a function of a long period of very low interest rates. Yeah, and so um, should that change, and should the gap between the interest rate and the preferred return hurdle uh, narrow significantly, or maybe even flip around at some point? I still remember. Um, Double-digit interest rates from yeah. a long time ago. Um, if uh, if the on 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 checking accounts. Um, so if if uh, if that does change, I think you may see less. Use, I would expect you'd see less use of these things. Yeah, we're sort of getting towards the end of the time. I would. I also wanted to touch on one thing, one other area which is quite interesting, which is the sale of minority stakes in the GPs. Uh, and we touched on that a bit last year when we were when when, when we met up. Um, but it. That seems to be continuing, and in fact, almost accelerating. I would, I, I would have thought, with dedicated funds for buying up stakes in GPs. Um, so the question is: Is that happening? And is that something which other GPs who aren't buying those stakes are worried about? So uh, yes, it's happening. It's happening to a significant degree. Uh, there were ten. There are ten large um, dedicated. Uh, investors in this in this product out there. So people who have raised dedicated funds to investing in minority stakes and sponsors, and they've got about twenty billion dollars uh, dedicated to that space. Wow. So there's a lot of interest in this. Um, there have been about thirty six, I think exactly thirty six, unless something happened in the last couple of days, of announced minority stake deals. Um, mm -hmm. As a law firm, obviously, we know about a lot of deals that are not announced, and I can tell you there are a lot of other deals uh, still happening. Twenty-one of those thirty-six deals happened in the last three years. So, to say that it, there's a lot of activity in this would be, uh, I think, an understatement. Um, the terms of these are, are relatively attractive to, to sponsors, or at least they're viewed by sponsors as relatively attractive, uh, including that they do allow or, or facilitate some generational changes at the sponsors. Mm -hmm. They facilitate the sponsors doing what we talked about. Uh, earlier, which is launching new product lines. Launching new product lines have a lot of expense associated to them that the sponsor might need to have to open offices, et cetera. And so getting some uh, money off the table from the assets they're selling and mm -hmm. able to be, be deployed um, into those efforts uh, is viewed as attractive. And also the sponsors on a new product line have to put up you know, capital sure. to, um, to you know, align interests with LPs. And so the capital uh, commitments that they're making for those new products are often funded by these, these transactions. Right. In addition to all of that, that's the stuff that says the money that stays inside the firm, so to speak, or at least is used for firm purposes. Um, you've got founders who have generated a lot of wealth, um, but it hasn't yet necessarily turned into liquid um, assets they can do something with outside of their funds. And so, um, you know, there is a desire to take some money off the table, and um, the investors are allowing uh, so-called secondary pieces of this, where, where they're kind of buying from the sponsor instead of just investing in the sponsor. Um, some of the, the interest in the sponsor, um, you know, the investors are willing to do that. And there are a few sponsors now that have done a second round. So, in other words, right. they sold, they had somebody invest three three years ago, let's say, 
four years ago, and now they've done you know, another round. So they might have sold 10% and they sold another 5% of the overall. I mean, that's a little bit of rough justice because sometimes they're selling larger pieces of, say, the fee and smaller pieces of the in-the-ground carry. Right. Um, they might be selling different percentages of kind of future funds. I see. So it's quite complicated uh, it's, then. It's, it's, it's very not like buying a, an equity stake in a business you know, from, from a founder. It's actually quite contractually linked to existing assets and, you're, and, and you're the buying future enterprise. flow yeah, of you're, assets? You're buying, in some various ways, you're buying a stake in the enterprise. Mm. And so, um, along lines I think you're alluding to, these things are hard to value. And um, until recently, you would, you'd see investors with very different values, because you have to have predictions about, are they going to launch new product lines? Yeah. What do those look like? What's the timing of raising those funds? What's the timing of realizing the assets that you already have? What's the timing on successor funds? How big are those successor funds going to be? Um, what's the performance of all, of all these uh, assets going to be? Um, and so there's lots of stuff that needs to be modeled out. And I think for a while, we were getting very different models and very different pricing. Uh, that's come together a fair amount. And so mm -hmm. investors are starting to view these things um, you know, more consistently across the different investors. Uh, but, but these deals are, are, are still happening. You're also seeing some large managers acquiring kind of wholesale product lines through acquisitions. So there is a desire to build the, the manager and, and get in, uh, more assets under management and uh, get the synergies from some of the work that you're doing, say, on the on the buyout side and be able to do that in, in credit or, right. uh, or even you know um, launching kind of various dedicated uh, either geographic or, or, or product lines. And so um, in some cases, managers are, are buying those. Uh, those deals are still happening. There's not a ton of them. It's still somewhat rare, uh, but there are some. Um, and, you know, it's it's a, a, a trend that has accelerated a lot over the last three years. And we mm -hmm. think it's going to, I don't know if it's going to accelerate because already there's a lot of activity, but we think it'll uh, continue for yeah. quite a while. That's interesting, isn't it? We're getting to that stage in the in the maturity of the asset class where all these succession issues and and getting external capital into what was an entrepreneurial business and still is an entrepreneurial business is much is much more significant and, now. And, and some LPs actually value that. So the, you know, if you think of this as sort of the some to some degree, the institutionalization of mm, the firm. That's right. If you're an investor who's got a billion dollars invested with his manager over a series of funds and you want to continue to have this manager manage your money, mm. um, you know, institutionalization of the firm yeah. is, is you want uh, is, smooth is, succession it, don't you it's it's an important issue for yeah you. that's right now we could carry on all day but unfortunately we've come to the end of our allotted time so chris i just wanted to say thank you very much again for for uh for coming along and answering answering all these questions and uh we look forward to seeing you in june in oxford uh and steve i will hand back to you now Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Chris, for, for that and some really interesting insights there uh, as to what's happening now and likely to continue to develop in PE over the over the, the coming years. Uh, as mentioned before, we are running the Oxford Private Equity Program uh, in June. We run this program once a year. Uh, places are available for the June program at the moment. Uh, if you would like to, to join in, I'm I know that schedules can sometimes change, but it would be very good to, to have your application or, or to hear from you to, to reserve a place now, because we expect that program to, to sell out uh, by, by the next six weeks or so. If you haven't seen the details of the, the Oxford Private Equity Program before, then this is a executive development program for anybody working in the field or in aligned fields. So the program is a five-day program. It runs from Monday morning through till Friday lunchtime, early afternoon. Uh, and in that uh, time, we will do a number of, of activities. Uh, the program is led by Professor Tim Jenkinson, who has been lead, leading the conversation over the last 40 minutes or so, uh, including a, a number of guest speakers who come in through the week. And I'll give you a bit of insight as to who that is uh, in a moment. So uh, coming on the program, then we uh, have 40 people in the class. That will be a very uh, international group and a very experienced group. So those 40 people uh, will come from about 15 to 20 different countries. Uh, they will each have about 15 to 20 years professional experience each. So you'll see that then that you will be uh, sitting alongside uh, uh, a qualified but uh, 
uh, equal group of peers alongside you. That group is made up of roughly equal parts of uh, four to, to, to five sections. So we have people from GPs, uh, we have people from LPs, we have people from banks, we have people from corporates. Uh, in that corporate kind of uh, group, there will be people who are working internally in terms of running M&A or in terms of a, an internal holding fund. Uh, and the final 20% or so will be people from banks, law firms, uh, service providers to the, to the PE industry. Uh, a quick out, uh, outline of the program for what we are planning for June. So we have guest speakers in, in here. Uh, some of these are confirmed. Some of these are sub subject to final uh, confirmation. So we've got a couple of uh, invitations out. We're just hoping to, to confirm those over the next week or two. The Monday very much looks at setting the scene for private equity. Uh, and really, we kind of follow the, the money through the week as we go through. So the first day is looking from the LP side. So uh, how much of the uh, portfolio does it make sense to allocate to private equity and why? What are the, some of the limits around that in terms of fees, liquidity, risks, et cetera? Uh, and how might that uh, develop in, in the future with, with, uh, with how things are working out? We also look at how funds are structured. We look at incentives for, for for funds to perform. We look at how they have performed and we also look at how uh, each fund always claims to be a top quartile fund. How can that be so? And what are some of the some of the, the, the tricks and numbers which uh, funds often use and how can you try to, 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 to see through those? We'll have a guest speaker that day who is Jack Edmondson from the Oxford University Endowment Fund. So uh, Jack is uh, one of ours. So he completed his MBA at Oxford, uh, then went to work uh, in London in PE for 10 years or so, uh, and then returned to the uh, to, to to the city to work for the university endowment about five to ten years ago uh, where he heads up the, 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 the private equity investing and works very closely with the CIO. Uh, the second day we will have uh, a morning with Chris Kalos who has just been joining us just now so thank you again for that Chris uh, and on this day Chris will really be looking through fund formation, governance, some of the economics of that and then doing an exercise to model the waterfall so how does how do the returns get distributed uh, through th through the chain, through the value chain? So we, we will see that uh, modeled out uh, and, and work on that. In the afternoon, we have another LP, uh, Joe Topley from Ontario Teachers uh, Pension Plan, who will be uh, looking at GPs and co-investments, a very hot topic, uh, one that's been developing over the last three years or so. Uh, some of the, 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 the large uh, Pension plans uh, from, from the US and Canada have been, been, been working on direct investments and co-investments. It'd be very interesting to, to hear Joe's take on that. Uh, we would then have a session on L LBOs, followed by uh, a guest speaker from, from the GP side. Uh, and we have an invitation out to Johannes Huth from KKR, who will very much look from the GP side, what are the current trends in, in private equity? How are they continuing to add value uh, in, in, in the economic situation as it is? And hear from that side about, are we, you know, are we at 2008 levels? What's going to happen next? What's the risks? What's the opportunities as we go forward from here? You'll see as we look at this timetable that the, each uh, day is a mixture. So if there is a guest speaker listed here, then that will be an industry person and we'll have a, a range of, of sessions with them from GP, LP, uh, service provider side. We also have uh, lecture sessions uh, by Tim Jenkinson. Now those lecture sessions are by themselves very interactive. So this is a group of about 40 people, think more of a, a classroom uh, and also a, a a workshop environment. So we expect and encourage everybody to uh, share their expertise and experience. So uh, we want experienced people in the room to we want to, 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 to hear their voices. Uh, 
and we also we also will put you in syndicate groups to do uh, at least one case study a day so typically one or two sessions with tim in the classroom one or two small group sessions working at case on case studies and one or two sessions with industry guest speakers so a very varied uh format we're not just listening to to to, to one person for a week uh we're not just doing case studies we're doing it uh, we're doing a full range Wednesday, we will look at some LBO modeling uh, in, uh, in syndicate groups and debriefing with Tim. Uh, so LBOs, kind of mid-market is the core of, uh, of, of PE, so understanding more of the basics of that. Going into Wednesday afternoon, we will have uh, a focus more on what it is like to work for PE-backed companies with a, with a couple of guest speakers. So first of all, Chris Sullivan, who is a partner with Clifford Chance, looking at the, the management deal in a, in a PE-backed company. Uh, and then later on that afternoon, we have Chris Woodhouse, uh, currently at Tilney, but who has been CEO of a number of different organizations actually owned by, by private equity, including the RAC, Agent, Agent Provocateur, uh, the Gondola Pizza Chain, uh, who own many of the high street uh, names that, that, that you will see, to very, really talk again about Okay, so what's it like to be uh, a senior manager in a company owned by private equity? What are some of the pros? What are some of the cons? Uh, Thursday, we have a, a quick session on venture capital. Uh, and then going into, again, more, more on the, the, the structure inside. And in th into Thursday afternoon, then looking at emerging markets. So if private equity is becoming to be a mature asset class in US, in Europe, then some of the, the upcoming large opportunities uh, certainly be in emerging markets. So we will have a focus on investing in Africa uh, with Andrew Newington from Actis. Uh, we're also looking at uh, emerging Europe with EBRD and Fossamala from, from EBRD. Thursday night, we will go out for dinner, uh, which will be at Balliol College, uh, so one of the historic colleges in Oxford. The networking and social side of this program uh, is very important as well. And so we have people from across uh, across the sector, GPs, LPs, service providers, banks, corporates. Uh, so it's a very uh, social social group. There are activities uh, every every evening some of them are optional but we certainly recommend that, that you take part in them and we certainly wouldn't want to miss the dinner at Balliol College on the Thursday. Friday we wrap up by looking at exit routes uh, so how do GPs get out of deals what are some of the pros and cons of the various exit routes be that the strategic sale IPO etc uh, and Following off, really, uh, and finishing off for the last hour or so, really sum summarizing some of the findings from the week, but also looking at some of the research from the Private Equity Institute, which Tim is the director of. What are, what are the academic uh, studies showing now? And importantly, what might that mean for the markets going forwards from here on in? So we very much hope that you can join us for that week in June. Uh, we talk a little bit about the, the sectors and the experience. This is some of the, the list of some of the types of people who attend the programs. This is probably very small on your screen, but uh, we will send you a recording of this webinar afterwards. And if you would like to talk in more detail about who is coming this year, then please contact uh, myself or my colleague, Sara Nima, and we'd be happy to, 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 to talk to you about that. Uh, next steps, the dates for the program, 25th to the 29th of June. Uh, the website is in front of you now. Uh, we are accepting applications, as I say. We are about 60, 70% full for June. Uh, we would very much recommend that you contact us now if you would like to, to take one of the remaining places. Uh, my details are on the screen in front of you now. You can email, email me directly, Steve Brewster at sbs.ox.ac.uk, or my colleague, Sara Nima, would be very happy to help you and advise on the program as well. Her email address is also uh, in front of you. Uh, just in terms of logistics, uh, we have some hotel rooms booked at the Randolph Hotel, which is one of the large central hotels in, uh, in Oxford. Uh, so yeah, if you want to help to uh, build the network and stay somewhere very convenient with other members of the group, then we're reserving some rooms to, to make that easy for you. Uh, 
that would be on top of the fee. Uh, the actual fee for the program is seven thousand uh, pounds. So yeah, if you would like to come, please uh, consider the dates uh, and get in touch with us now. Just really leads me to thank you very much for listening to the webinar today. I hope that you found that as interesting and informative as, uh, uh, as I have, and that and that we will in the in the program in June. Uh, thank you again to Tim Jenkinson for leading the conversation, and a special thank you to Chris Callos for hosting Tim today down at the offices at Kirkland and Ellis in London, and for taking time from his uh, visit over here to to do the webinar today. Thank you, guys, and thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.